Hello there. I hope everybody is doing okay, especially those of you that are down there in Florida in the middle of a hurricane and the rest of you, of course, as well, that are baking across the country, except for those of you that are in that sweet spot in Northern California you like to brag about where it's always just temperate. You guys can go F yourselves and invite me out to your homes. I'm very happy to have you here and thank you for pressing play in today's podcast. I have a great guest joining me today. Well, his name is Shad White. He is the Mississippi State Auditor. He wrote a new book. It's called Mississippi Swindle, Brett Favre and the Welfare Scandal that Shocked America. But guess what? He's also a Republican and a Trump supporter. It's a very interesting conversation. The first half of it, we focus on the book. The second half, we talk politics and we really mix it up. But I think it went very well, and he did too, and hopefully he'll come back. I think you're really going to like it. That interview begins at 21 minutes into today's show. But first, of course, I've got to get to those headlines that I do each and every day, as well as your sound bites. I can't do any of it without your paid subscription. This show is brought to you by you. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic right now to support the show and my work as little as five bucks. And you can always pay a lot more. Thanks to everybody who's upgraded their subscription. Please consider it. It makes a huge difference to keep us going. And speaking of keeping us going, I think I'll host a hangout tonight if In fact, Kamala Harris does decide who she's going to choose to be her running mate. It's either apparently going to be Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, or Tim Waltz, the governor of Minnesota, who a whole bunch of people are discovering and liking quite a bit. I feel like I've seen many photos of Tim Waltz holding a baby pig or a kitten. The guy is always holding animals, unlike RFK, who is constantly eating them, a dog, a bear, whatever it is. Anyway, Josh Shapiro looks pretty good, too, although a lot of people have issues with him, a lot of uh, more progressive lefties on issues regarding the Middle East, regarding charters, his lack of support for teachers unions and others. So we'll see. Either way, I hope we can still t- stay together and it doesn't come become in any way divisive. J.L. Covan tweeted yesterday, I think there is only one correct vice president pick for Vice President Harris. And if she selects anyone other than my choice, I will be forced to vote for Donald Trump. So I thought that was funny. All right. That's the big story leading the news. And it may have been announced by the time my voice is hitting your ears. And so let's move on and not spend a lot of time on it. Debbie is now a tropical storm after hitting Florida as a hurricane. The system landfalled Monday morning near Florida's Big Bend area, and it's expected to unleash potentially historic rainfall in Georgia and South Carolina could cause catastrophic flooding. So thinking of all of those of you in the eye of the storm, the other big story Monday was that a wave of anxiety rippled through financial markets with stocks falling in the U.S. and around the world as investors zeroed in on signs of a potentially slowing American economy. I'll dig in to that more. But that was a big story yesterday. The presidential election is now 91 days away. News that One of the lawyers who helped Donald Trump try to stay in power after his election loss has agreed to a plea deal in Arizona election interference case. That woman's name is Jenna Ellis. You might remember her. She was a real firebrand for Trump. Not so much anymore. Also news yesterday that a federal judge ruled that Google had acted illegally to maintain a monopoly in online search. A landmark decision that may fundamentally alter the way tech giants do business. Big deal to have this judge ruling that Google violated antitrust laws. I definitely want to talk with some experts about that. We learned more corruption from the Supreme Court, specifically Justice Clarence Thomas yesterday. We learned he failed to publicly disclose more private travel provided by a wealthy conservative donor, Harlan Crow, according to a Democratic senator, Ron Wyden, who has been all over this guy's case. Very, very good. And also very, very bad. Late breaking story out of Iraq that two rockets uh, Monday, yesterday, were fired at Iraq's Ain al-Assad Air Base, which hosts U.S. and other international forces in western Iraq, security forces sources said. Not clear if the attack caused any casualties or damage inside the base. And the crisis in Bangladesh continued. The prime minister there resigned and left the country, according to the army chief. A day after almost 100 people were killed in clashes with the police, the student-led protesters demanded she step down. And keep an eye on this one. Two prosecutors said yesterday that they plan to file a criminal obstruction of justice charge against a former central Kansas police chief over his conduct following a raid last year on the town's newspaper, on his town's newspaper. Remember that? When the police raided a newspaper, that was a big deal story. And now apparently there's going to be criminal charges. 
All right, those are the headlines that I've gathered for you from yesterday. Let's get to the sound that I found. Hey, I should use that every day. The sound that I found. All right, let's start with economics professor from University of Michigan and senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, Justin Wolfert. He was on CNN yesterday calming everybody down about the market meltdown, and I liked his analysis and his Australian accent. Well, time now for the exchange and some perspective on today's rough days in the markets. Joining me now is Justin Wolfert, economics and public policy professor at the University of Michigan. I've been following you online, my friend, and it seems you're not very panicked about the sell-off as well, and uh, concerns about a recession are not top of mind for you. Yeah, there's basically two kinds of talking heads you can see on TV today. If you, if you flip over to any of the financial channels, it'll be someone who works in markets. Their annual bonus, their well-being, their quality of life, their everything is the S&P 500, and it's been in for a rocky road. But flip on over to this conversation, Bianca, and I'm an economist, which means I'm looking at the numbers about that affect your viewers' lives, things like their wages, their employment, uh, their incomes, uh, spending in the economy. And all of the actual data about the economy tell us that this is an economy that is currently doing pretty well. So there's two ways to square that circle. It, it could be the financial market guys are looking ahead and they see danger in the future that the rest of us can't quite see. Or it could be that for about the 400 millionth time, they're having a freak out. And it's a big freak out. It's a messy freak out. But it's not one that fundamentally affects yours and my lives. (laughs) For about the 400 millionth time, they're wrong. You know what? I like him so much. Let's get a little bit more from that guy. I got to try to get him on the show. Here's what he said. He said the U.S. unemployment data on Friday, as we noted, was weaker than expected, but it does not look like a recession. Uh, the Fed officials need to be cognizant of changes in the environment to avoid being too restrictive with interest rates. He goes on to say with regards to interest rates, you only want to be that restrictive if you think there's fear of overheating. These data, to me, does not look like overheating. Do you agree? Yes, And it's a subtle story, so you really do have to pay attention, which is, look, the economy was – we got used to the last three years of an absolutely skyrocketing economy. Now, it wasn't all skyrocketing. It was a lot of bounce back from a very deep pandemic recession. And the last few years have just been incredibly unusual and incredibly difficult for a lot of families. Um, But it also led to some eye-popping economic statistics as, as we had that bounce back. Now, that bounce back is over and it's behind us. We're now at the point where the economy is gloriously, splendidly dull. Now, during dull times, we economists fight over whether the unemployment rate has risen by half a percent or a quarter of a percent and what we should do. And Austin's right to say there are some reasons that we really do want to make sure that we're not holding back on the economy right now. Um, And I think the Fed understands that. And while it didn't move at its last meeting, we're going to see a bit more action over the next few meetings. And so all of this is just what happens when an economy returns to normal. The thing I want your viewers to understand is this is actually a relatively normal, boring economics debate. It's not quite the headlines you'd get from watching financial markets today. There you go. More from Justin Wolfers on CNN yesterday. Let's head over to Fox News, where Neil Cavuto made it political, but not what you think, you know, for Fox News. I know and you do not politicize these things, but the, the Donald Trump thing in the market amazes me. When they're up, it's all because of him and looking forward to him. When they're down, it's all because the Democrats and how horrific they are. Um, yet some of our biggest point fall offs, three of the biggest of the top 10 occurred during his administration. Now, a lot of those were in the covid years. I get that. But, I, you know, you either own the markets or you don't. It, it does confuse me. But thank you for uh, giving an overview there. We're going to be pursuing that and who's thank to you. blame, who's to take credit. And, and we will be following up on that. But uh, I keep a very, very close look at all the records here, Salos and otherwise. The three big ones, the three biggest among them in, in history of the markets occurred during the Trump administration. Not all on him, but they did occur under his his watch. So. All right, there you go. And guess what else? I got another clip of Fox News where they have a liberal on the panelist arguing with Bill Hemmer and I don't know who else was there. Robert, you cover the economy as well. Uh, if we're heading yeah, for a recession, years, yeah, so how, how difficult de- could this be for Kamala Harris? Yeah, I'd, l- I'd love to debate both you guys on the economy. GDP is higher. Um, jobs is higher. Wages is higher. The stock market's up huge under Biden. This idea of what you guys are talking about, there's more 2,000-day losses 
under President Trump than 500 day losses under Joe Biden. We should get the facts right on where the economy is. Bill, you do a great job on that. But we know that Friday was, uh, if if not for the outstanding 15 million plus jobs of the Biden-Harris um, campaign over the last three and a half years, 140,000 less plus is normal jobs. There's not going to be a recession. I, I actually think that there's a possibility that uh, we're going to have uh, the August numbers look okay. incredibly strong. All right, well, a lot of those recovery jobs coming back, we know that. But listen, the markets are spooked to the a end of last week. A lot of them were not as well, and you know the that markets too. Were sco- All right, that's all I've got for you on yesterday's market panic. And now let's stay with Fox News because this is uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch in his own words. He sat down for an interview with Fox News yesterday. After, by the way, he warned President Biden to, quote, be careful with Supreme Court reforms. A lot of people saw that as an inappropriate thing for him to say and a threat even. Well, in an interview with Fox News, he highlighted the need for a fair justice system responded to President Joe Biden's proposal for sweeping reforms. And then he touted what he thought was, you know, they're doing a great job. They're doing a very fair job. So here it is. Listen to this nonsense. Well, I I think the court's doing a pretty good job. I'll be honest with you, Sandra. Um, You ask us to decide the 70 hardest cases in the country every year. Cases where the lower courts have disagreed. And there are nine of us. Can you get nine of your colleagues to agree on where to go to lunch? (laughs) Right? No. And we've been appointed by five different presidents over 30 years. And we are able to reach a unanimous judgment in these hard cases about 40% of the time. Do you hear that? Now, that's the same figure as it was in about 1945 when Franklin Roosevelt had appointed eight of the nine justices of the Supreme Court. Okay, now you say, well, what about those divided cases, those six threes? Fine. Fine. Well, the six threes this term, only about half of them are the ones you're thinking about. The others are more scrambled um, uh, groupings. According to the New York Times last term, uh, in 45% of ideologically divided cases, whatever that means, I agreed with what the Times called the liberal result. Mm-hmm. That's the court I know. Yeah. And that those, quote, ideological cases, six to three, it's about a third of our docket this last year. And again, that's about the same number as it was in 1945. So really, my experience with this court is nothing changes. Which brings me. Ah, Wow. A lot of people had a lot to say about that. I'll be talking with Siegel and others about it, but uh, that's Justice Neil Gorsuch's own words. And I'm going to stay at Fox News for yet another clip because J.D. Vance's wife, Usha Vance, sat down with Ainsley Earhart to talk about childless cat ladies and all of that. And uh, she was dismissive of it. She just thought it was, you know, just a quip. Just a quip. There are a few comments that are out there that I have to ask you about. In 2021, J.D. said we are effectively run by a bunch of childless cat ladies Mm -hmm. taking aim at government leaders who don't have children. What was your reaction? Well, I mean, I, I, I took a moment to look and actually see what he had said and try to understand what the context was and all that, which is something that I really wish people would do a little bit more often. And the reality is he made a quip in service of making a point that he wanted to make that was substantive and it had actual meaning. Um, and I, I just wish sometimes that people would talk about those things and that we would spend a lot less time just sort of going through this three-word phrase or that three-word phrase because what he was really saying is that it can be really hard to be a parent in this country and sometimes our policies are designed in a way that make it even harder and we should be asking ourselves why is that true what is it about our leadership and the way that they think about the world that makes it so hard sometimes for parents and that's the conversation that i really think that we should have and i i understand why he was saying that oh well i could think of some things that would make it a whole lot easier on parents in terms of education health care and economic opportunity as well as having to pay off college loans and a whole bunch of other bullshit but you're not for those i don't think all right now here is a weird moment over on i think this is msnbc nancy pelosi is promoting a new book which actually looks pretty interesting and she was asked about her relationship with president biden and it gets well a little weird you decide have you spoken to president biden since he dropped out no i have not do you hope to yes i hope to yeah we're all busy is is everything okay with your relationship You'd have to ask him, but I hope okay. so. But he knows. Uh, look, I have loved Joe Biden, respected him for over 40 years. Mm-hmm. We have, I was uh, 
party chair in California, then I became member of Congress, and then one thing, other housewife, house member, house speaker, working with him all along. I think he has made one of the biggest contributions to our country in the shortest period of time. All right, correct me. Uh, that was Nancy Pelosi on CNN with Dana Bash. And finally, the funny, final audio clip I have for you is four minutes long, and I hope it doesn't lose you. It didn't lose me, but I was watching the video sometimes. I don't know. Maybe this is too long, but I thought this was great. Uh, thank you to Kim Nyborg, who sent this my way, by the way. This is Texas Representative James Tallarico. He is a former school teacher, and he is a religious man. He's a Christian. He sounds like a preacher to me. He's actually raised Presbyterian, very active in the Presbyterian Church in Austin there. And anyway, I just loved what he had to say about Christian nationalism and what would Jesus do and the rest. Thanks to Kim Nyborg for sending me this four-minute clip. I hope you like it, and then we'll get to my conversation with Shad White. My granddad was a Baptist preacher. I've been a member of this church since I was two years old, and now I'm in seminary studying to become a minister myself. My faith means more to me than anything. But if I'm being very honest, sometimes I hesitate for telling someone I'm a Christian. There is a cancer on our religion. Until we confess the sin that is Christian nationalism and exorcise it from our churches, our religion can do a lot more damage than a six-pack of Lone Star. There is nothing Christian about Christian nationalism. It is the worship of power, social power, economic power, political power in the name of Christ. And it is a betrayal of Jesus of Nazareth. He told us we would know them by their fruits. Jesus includes Christian nationalism excludes. Jesus liberates. Christian nationalism controls. Jesus saves. Christian nationalism kills. Jesus started a universal movement based on mutual love. Christian nationalism is a sectarian movement based on mutual hate. Jesus came to transform the world. Christian nationalism is here to maintain the status quo. They have co-opted the Son of God. They've turned this humble rabbi into a gun-toting, gay-bashing, science-denying, money-loving, fear-mongering fascist. And it is incumbent upon all Christians to confront it and denounce it. Amen. How did this happen? The first followers of Jesus didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves the way. Their crucified teacher taught them a different way of being human, and they intended to follow it. The early church was a revolutionary community built on radical love, a peculiar people who shared all their possessions and refused to participate in the economy, the military, or the culture. The book of Acts tells us that the first Christians were persecuted for turning the world upside down. But 300 years after Jesus was executed by the Roman Empire, Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official state religion of that very same empire. Constantine was the first Christian nationalist. Pro-war, pro-wealth, pro-white supremacy. That original countercultural movement became a tranquilized, privatized, weaponized religion the official sponsor of Western civilization. A religion of sharing became a religion of greed. A religion of peace became a religion of violence. A religion of forgiveness became a religion of judgment. A religion of ego transformation became a religion of ego affirmation. Today, Christian nationalists obsess over people's private parts while the planet burns. The Bible doesn't mention abortion or gay marriage, but it goes on and on about forgiving debt, liberating the poor, and healing the sick. Christian nationalists like to say this is a Christian nation. Not only is that historically inaccurate, not only is that theologically blasphemous, but it's also just not true. Look around us. If this was truly a Christian nation, we would forgive student debt. If this was truly a Christian nation, 
We would guarantee health care to every single person. If this was truly a Christian nation, we would love all of our LGBTQ neighbors. If this was truly a Christian nation, we would make sure every child in this state and in this country was housed, fed, clothed, educated, and insured. If this was truly a Christian nation, we would never make it a Christian nation. Because we know the table of fellowship is open to everybody, including our Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, Sikh, and atheist neighbors. Jesus could have started a Christian theocracy, but love would never do that. The closest thing we have to the kingdom of heaven is a multiracial, multicultural democracy where power is truly shared among all people, something that's yet to exist in human history. Wow, there you go. Uh, that is State Representative, Texas State Representative James Tallarico. I thought that was powerful. Thanks to Kim Nyborg for sending me that. And now I think my guest, my next guest, I didn't ask him, but he sounds like he, he would identify as a Christian nationalist. But uh, you can decide, and I'll ask him at some point. Hopefully I'll get to talk to him again. He's the state auditor of Mississippi. And during his tenure, the auditor's office has uncovered more waste, fraud, and abuse than at any other time in state history. He's also a prolific writer on fraud. His work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, The Hill, and other publications. He's a certified fraud examiner. He's got degrees from Harvard Law School, University of Oxford, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar, and the University of Mississippi. He also serves as a captain in the Mississippi National Guard. This is his first book, but it's a riveting expose that tells the story of a small group of people who misappropriated and misdirected federal money intended for some of the poorest inhabitants of our nation's poorest state in a sprawling conspiracy that stretches from Mississippi to Malibu. Of course, this is the one that implicated uh, Brett Favre and many others. The book is called Mississippi Swindle, Brett Favre and the Welfare Scandal that Shocked America. At about 28 minutes, we shift to talking to politics and find out more about him being a Trump supporter. It gets real interesting there if it wasn't in the first half hour. I hope you like it. Let me know. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on Stand Up, the auditor from Mississippi, state auditor, it's Shad White. There he is, Shad White. Mississippi swindle, Brett Favre, and the welfare scandal that shocked America. Shad, what a read, what a controversy, and what an interesting guy you are. Very excited to talk to you and have you on the show for the first time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, you work in government. You're, you're the auditor there in Mississippi. You got the shirt on and everything with the, the crests and everything. Talk to me about your why you wanted to, to get into that role. I mean, you're a Rhodes Scholar. You went to Harvard, and you're working in government as an auditor? Go ahead. Well, to start with, I love Mississippi. I grew up here. I grew up in a, a little bitty town in rural Mississippi, and so it was kind of always my desire to to be in Mississippi, to raise my family here, to be near my family, and to and to give back to the state. I mean, that, that may sound hokey, but uh, Mississippi gets a bad rap all around the country, and and I I think we have a beautiful state. We have amazing people, and and I just I wanted to be here. So at the end of my time at law school, um, I I really just decided that you know professionally I wasn't going to to go to a Wall Street firm or go to a DC firm or whatever it may be. I wanted to be back here, and the thing that really interested me at that moment was criminal law. So I, I wasn't interested in criminal law really up until law school, but. You had to take crim law your first year of law school, and I loved it. And then after that, I took everything I could I could find to take that related to criminal law, became really interested in white-collar law. And so uh, really, once I got back to Mississippi and settled in, I, I wanted to find some job as a prosecutor and, and had trouble finding a job as a prosecutor down here. And I uh, practiced law in the, in the private sector for a little while and then at a nonprofit. And, and then this job opened up. Uh, in 2018. So in Mississippi, the state auditor's position is an elected position. But if the current office holder steps down, the governor gets the right to appoint the next person. And so I had a relationship with the governor. I'd worked on one of his campaigns and, and I called him and I said, you know, I know this is unusual, but uh, I, I, as a 32 year old, would like to be considered to be state auditor. Here are five things that I would do differently in the office or things I would improve and, and if this were an opening for a state treasurer or secretary of state, I would not be calling you because this specific job is really interesting to me. This, this job where you can dive into how we spend public money, when you, where you can dive into uh, public corruption and white collar crime, this is interesting to me. And, and so, yeah, a couple of weeks later, I was state auditor and have been doing this job for six years since then. That Governor Phil Bryant? Correct. Yep. 
you introduced us to him uh, right at the beginning of the book. Fascinating character that he is. Now the governor is Tate Reeves. They're, they're term limits, right? That's right. Two yeah. term limits. Is it six years? Eight years total. Oh, wow. Oh, you can do two terms of four years apiece. Correct. Got yes, it. that's right. So eight years total. Uh, so auditor, though, I mean, tell us what that job was. And obviously it got pretty fascinating. I, I was I would imagine, man, I don't, I don't love numbers the way you do. But I would imagine it's pretty interesting just to see where money goes and how government spends money and, you know, uh, understanding that you're the authority on, on where it should be spent legally, I guess we can define what your what your role is. But what is it? Yeah, you, you said it very well. I mean, our, our main purpose in the auditor's office is to make sure that government money goes to where it is legally allowed to go. And, and so every state has some office kind of similar to mine, but they all operate a little bit differently. Some are appointed, some are elected, some have a law enforcement arm, some do not. So uh, my office does have a law enforcement arm. We have a team of CPAs and they do the routine audits of county governments and state agencies and school districts. But if we find that someone has defrauded the taxpayers or taken a kickback or something like that, we also have an investigative arm. And that that team is made up of career investigators, uh, data analysts, attorneys, and they will do criminal investigations into what has happened. And if we find something sort of like the FBI, we do the investigation part and then we take it to a prosecutor, maybe the state attorney general or the local DA or the federal prosecutor for our area. And, and we give it to them and then they make a decision about whether or not they would like to indict that individual. So so for me, um, I love this job because of the unique platform that we have, because of the broad jurisdiction that we have and, and the chance to actually get at public corruption and actually get at these questions of how are we spending public money and could we be doing it a better or smarter way? So. Tell me, before we get into the scandal that is the centerpiece of your book, Mississippi Swindle, some of the other investigations and crimes that you've you've investigated and then eventually were prosecuted. I mean, what kind of things do do individuals, organizations, entities do? We've had the tiniest of cases. So we're talking um, a woman who works at a, uh, a water department for a municipality taking people's water payments taking the cash, and then when the person walks out the door, just stuffing it down her shirt in front of the security camera. I mean, we've had cases that are that small and that cut and dry all the way up to really this case here, this uh, the, the, the welfare scandal, which is the largest public fraud case that, that we've had in my time in office, um, and everything in between. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the cases that we have – involve programs that are designed to help poor people. So we, we still have the highest poverty rate in the country down here in Mississippi. We've improved a lot over the course of the last 60 years in terms of our poverty rate. But unfortunately, about one out of five people are still in poverty here in Mississippi. So we have a lot of programs geared toward poverty. And, and unfortunately, that means that, you know, a nonprofit director will come forward and say they can fix this problem for, for you know, this, this specific part of the community, oh, I can do this housing repair program if you give me public money. And uh, all too often we find those people eventually stealing those grant dollars. So that's that's been a big part of the work that we're doing down here. How often is it so often it's it's private contractors trying to get government contracts, a lot of money there. And uh, and as you just illustrated, they, they, they do something wrong, inappropriate or illegal, or it's just not effective, even if it's all on the up and up. But how often is it like the state agency itself uh, or a school district or any other government agency that is committing a, a crime or a fraud? Is that, is that yeah, common? it's it's unfortunately very common. So if you look at if you look back on social media and the news releases from my office, you know, we make an arrest about every couple of weeks. Uh, I just we just announced one uh, in, five, in the five minutes before we started the show. Wow. And unfortunately, most of the arrests that we make are of government employees who are doing something to benefit themselves. Um, sometimes we'll find vendors who are also a part of that. But I'll be honest with you. This is this is true around the country. Kickback schemes where a vendor is getting a contract and then kicking dollars back to the person in the government who made the decision to give them the contract. Kickback schemes are typically some of the hardest fraud schemes to prove. So our usual cases actually just involve somebody in the government embezzling funds or, or taking property that doesn't belong to them. So before we get in, really fascinating. I mean, I'll have you list those issues and, and crimes and agencies the whole time. It'd be interesting 
to hear more about it, what people think they're going to get away with, et cetera, is always fascinating as well. Uh, but before we get specifically to the book, I want to try to settle at least two controversies I found before uh, so you can clear them up. W- one of which is just not a controversy, I guess. It's just that you're doing this. I heard these like conservative – you're conservative, and I heard these conservative guys talking about you. I thought you were on it, so I listened to it. They were talking about you, and they sound like they're trying to be like, oh, I really like him on this and this, but I don't like that he's doing – that he's written this book. And I think their main point was something about there hasn't been a trial yet. And, and the book is out. The other one is some people think that you're doing this for your own personal ambition. And, and I guess recently you've, you've hinted towards maybe running for governor at some point, which would be fine. Uh, and you'd be uniquely qualified for it, I suppose. Uh, but the last thing was that I just saw just threw your name in Google news and found this story about how the attorney general there was uh, defending you in, in a case and she's dropped you as a client. So I thought I'd just give you the opportunity to address those three. And that's all I found uh, in terms of yeah. what people are saying about you or accusing you of before we get into the, the book. Yeah, I mean, my my main point for writing this book was to tell the taxpayers what happened here. And, um, you know, to, to go back to that first, I guess, criticism. Well, is it too early to write the book? I mean, Honestly, you know, it's been four years since we have arrested the first individuals in this case. It's been it's, it's been a long time since we started the investigation. Um, six people have pleaded guilty at this point. Um, we're not really at the beginning of this process. We're not in the middle of this process. This is the end of the process. I mean, we haven't we haven't been asked a meaningful question by the FBI on the investigation in months. Really, all the facts have been dug up. The The only thing remaining in the criminal side is for prosecutors to make their final decisions in these next couple of months about who they want to charge. So we're really at the end of the process, not the middle or the beginning. And, and so I think this is the perfect time to talk about what happened here so that everybody understands the scope of this. And, and hopefully taxpayers are informed so that it doesn't ever happen again. Uh, to that second kind of criticism of, oh, well, why would you do this? Um, you know, my answer is, look, if you think I'm getting rich off this case, this book, you're out of your mind. Um, you know, I was sued for defamation by Brett Favre. And and midway through that suit, the attorney general's office obtained my book because they were they were my lawyer at the time. And because I was honest in the book about her role in all of this, meaning meaning the work that they did not do to help us, uh, they dropped me as a client. And so then, you know, around the same time, I have to go hire my own personal attorney to defend me just for talking about an audit that we did, just for talking about how this money flowed and what happened down here in Mississippi. Uh, The amount of attorney's fees that I've accrued are three times what I got paid uh, as an advance to write the book. So, you know, this is not about Shad getting rich off the case. This is about telling the folks who who care the most about this case what actually happened down here and, and frankly just surviving the whole thing. That's that's what's in my head when I'm when I'm doing this. And finally what I would say is, you know, for folks who say, well, you know, are are you thinking about higher office? Well, yeah. And the part of the reason is that I've seen how broken government is down here. As auditor, my job is to investigate crimes and go to a prosecutor, try to get them prosecuted and identify waste. But I can't really fix any of these programs. That's not the role of the auditor. In fact, you're supposed to avoid trying to instruct anybody who's running a government program on how to do it. You're not supposed to manage those programs. You're supposed to identify facts. So at some point, somebody's got to get into a position in Mississippi state government where they are going to do a better job of rooting out the waste that we have and and making our government more efficient for taxpayers down here. Uh, Wow. So you've had to incur legal fees that are more than the advance for your book at this article I'm reading from January in Mississippi today. Is that a legitimate? They said that uh, by Friday evening, Shad White had already appointed in office counsel to represent him in both defamation suits. So but you said you hired personal lawyers that you had to pay for. Is this yes. reporting old or wrong? No, it's, it's correct. And, and I mean, you can, you have multiple lawyers on a case, right? So I have, I have an attorney in my office who is handling the portions that they have the capacity to handle. And then I have my own private attorneys, both working together on the case. All right. The last kind of critical question like this is only, again, from that article and from the attorney general. 
uh, who is disputing statements. I guess they haven't identified statements. But again, this is back in January. I'm finding this. You'll be able to correct it uh, all here. But but um, I guess my question is, when you wrote the book, did you did you reach out to, in this case, the attorney general or anybody else to allow them to see the statements as a journalist kind of would to to be either to corroborate it or to dispute it? No, because they were in the rooms when they were making the decisions, right? So, so we would have a meeting. I'll give you an example of, yeah. of uh, an, a meeting that happened, but it's also discussed in the book. Uh, we had a meeting at the attorney general's office very early in this case, and I made the point in the meeting, look, really, I think the attorney general's office ought to send attorneys down to try to seize some of the property that was purchased with welfare money but was in the hands of some of these folks who eventually pleaded guilty to crimes. And we're talking about cars and things like that, because that property is technically government property. And and so if we don't seize that property now, it could magically walk off and we may never get a chance to get it. And so we had this meeting. Right. And then nothing happened as a result. The attorney general's office did not go and seize the property. The cars are gone as far as as, as far as I know. So. I wrote about that in the book. Now, you could say, well, why didn't you tell them you were going to write that in the book? Well, I didn't tell them because they were in the meeting. (laughs) They knew what went down. They know about all this stuff. They know what I asked them to do. Um, And they found out about it in the book long before the book came out publicly. So they've they've had months to craft their response if they if they want to have a response when the book comes out tomorrow. Well, let's get into it. Mississippi swindle. I've already read, you know, the 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 summary here uh, about it. But. This is a a huge, it was a huge case. It was national news. And this is, uh, it it seems so reprehensible on its face to take money from uh, TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, uh, which really, I think a lot of it goes to to, to feeding poor folks in your state and use it to build a a volleyball arena and uh, plenty of other things. Is, Is that a straightforward? And I mean, I know it's a lot more complex than that, but is that the most succinct way of describing what happened here? That's a great summary. That's a great summary. And the only two facts I would add are, uh, you know, when we when we added up the amount of money that was misspent, we're talking north of one hundred million dollars. There's a lot of money in Mississippi. And then on top of that, of course, we've had multiple individuals who have pleaded guilty to either state or federal charges for their role in it. So just again, um, what is that? What was that one hundred million dollars supposed to do? Yeah, in general, it's supposed to go to help the needy. That's the that's the N in the TANF program uh, acronym. And, and so a lot of states do this a lot of different ways. Historically, when we've thought about welfare, which is which is what we call this program, um, you know, you, you typically think about checks to poor people. And some states still do a lot of that. Starting back in the mid 90s, states were given more flexibility about how they spend this money. And so some states have decided to uh, give big grants to nonprofits in their state. And then the grants are given on the basis that the nonprofit will do certain services for needy people. So that's the ideal way it works. In Mississippi, we were we were choosing to do a lot of the grant giving to, to small nonprofits. And that, unfortunately, is what led to this fraud when the, the director of DHS, the Department of Human Services here in Mississippi, which handles TANF funds, got into an arrangement with one of the heads of the, the local nonprofits, and they together conspired to defraud the taxpayers over several years of millions of millions of dollars. Now you're talking about John Davis, the head of yep. DHS, who you hilariously <laughs> describe him physically and his just demeanor, like when you showed up at his office. It was uh, I can't find it now. He was just ridiculously kind to the point it made you uncomfortable. We've all we've all been around that guy. Uh, yeah. Where does Brett Favre come into this and how dare you attack this Ole Miss hero? I mean, isn't he a hero in Mississippi? Didn't he go to Ole Miss? And isn't he like, uh, no, he, he went to the University of Southern Mississippi. Oh, excuse me. But he's a Mississippi. You know, he's got to be one of the most famous, beloved people from the state, which might make your job a lot harder. Uh, and it sounded like that. And these radio guys are like, why is he going after Brett Favre? He's our, he's our guy. And he's this and he's that. Brett Favre, by the way, has a pretty checkered past, uh, regardless of this. But regardless, uh, you know, tell me about how he comes in and how it's how it's been for you to be the guy coming after him. He sued you even. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, Brett Favre. Certainly one of the most famous Mississippians. And I grew up in South Mississippi. I grew up about, I guess, 40 or so minutes from the University of Southern Mississippi. My mom went there. 
Uh, he was the star quarterback there and, of course, an NFL Hall of Famer. So every little boy in, in Mississippi growing up knows who Brett Favre is, and, and many of them idolize Brett Favre. How did Brett Favre come up in, in the context of this case? Well, as we're doing this investigation, we found three different buckets of money that related in some way to Mr. Favre. So the first was $1.1 million of welfare funds went to Favre Enterprises, and we dug into that a bit, and, and as best we can tell, there was one contract that required him to give some speeches and do some things in order to get that money. And um, and so when we dug into it a bit further, we realized that he had not given those speeches. Jeez. Whether, he knew, whether he knew he was supposed to give them or not, you know, for our purposes doesn't matter because if you're supposed to do a set of things in order to get money and you didn't do those things, well, guess what? That's an illegal, unallowable payment. So there was that. The second piece was uh, a big chunk of money that went to a company called Prevacus. Prevacus is an experimental concussion treatment company, and Brett Favre was a major investor in Prevacus. Uh, what we found there was uh, that the money was going to this company, and, and TANF money, which is intended to benefit the poor, can't go to a company like that. Uh, and then, of course, you may have seen a few weeks ago the head of that company, a guy named Jacob Van Lanningham, has pleaded guilty to federal charges for defrauding the program for wire fraud. Uh, related to that piece of it. And then finally, there was a chunk of money that went to pay for a, a very high-end volleyball court at the University of Southern Mississippi, where, where Favre's an alum. Obviously, he was a star football player. His daughter was attending, um, and she plays volleyball. And so that was not an allowable use of welfare funds because you can't use welfare money to build a brick-and-mortar facility. And of course, again, we could find no proof that that brick and mortar facility, this fancy volleyball court, uh, had done anything to benefit the needy in Hattiesburg. So, so these are the three buckets that we find that relate to Mr. Favre. And, and then we release all of this information, along with all the other ways the welfare money had been spent in an audit back in mid-2020. Shortly after that, of course, it made national news because, uh, because there's a big amount of money. It was welfare funds. And, and in part because Mr. Favre's name was, uh, was brought up, Favre Enterprises, it's obvious who that, that belongs to. So anyway, during that period, Mr. Favre, we now know, texted some of his associates and said, uh, you know, I want to stick it to them. And them, I would assume, would be me or us here in the auditor's office. Uh, he later went on social media and said that what we were saying were just lies. And, and so, again, you know, when, when the question comes to me of, of why are you targeting Brett Favre, I'm not. I'm telling the truth about what happened here. And every time I tell the truth, unfortunately, that makes some folks mad. That's not my concern. You, you said it, Pete, at the very top, like your job must be hard. Actually, my job's really simple. It's to tell the truth. It's to have talented staff who dig up how money is spent and then tell the taxpayers what happened to it. Very, very straightforward. So that's what I've continued to do this entire time, and, and I really don't care about the reactions to it. Uh, I know that normal Mississippi taxpayers want to know where their money's going, and, and that's the responsibility that I owe to them. It'll be really interesting to see how your book gets received there in Mississippi, much less nationwide, and I, I'd love to you know check back in with you as that goes on. Uh, but the book is a, a, a real read in terms of where it takes through this whole case uh this lasted for a long time everything that happened and you dig into it and you tell us all about it tell us you know a, a little bit more about how this played out and and what you discovered and you know how many you know you've already mentioned some people have already been prosecuted so we're pretty far along in this so take us through it a little bit more if you want the most interesting part if you can yeah, so so when we released this big audit back in 2020, it shows tens of millions of dollars of welfare funds that have gone down the drain. And when I say gone down the drain, I, I don't mean necessarily stolen. Not every penny was stolen, but it went to stuff that you can't spend TANF money on under the law. So we're talking about sponsorships for beauty pageants. We're talking about advertisements at a college bowl game outside of Mississippi. I don't know how many welfare recipients were in the stadiums that day, but that's not an allowable use of welfare funds. Those are the kinds of things that we saw. And in that audit, we spell it out. And, and of course, now, now, four years later, the state is in the middle of civil litigation, suing a whole bunch of these people, trying to get as much of that money back as possible. And, and I imagine that that case is going to last a good bit longer as they, as they try to get those dollars back into state coffers. While all of that is playing out, 
we take our findings to the local DA and the DA indicts six people. So then shortly after that, we take our findings over to the FBI. The FBI launches their own independent investigation where we are assisting. And so they're they're turning their findings over to the U.S. Attorney's Office down here. So now we've got two prosecutors engaged. And and ultimately, I said a moment ago, six people have pleaded guilty. The number is now actually seven with the most recent person. Seven folks have pleaded guilty. And uh, one person awaits trial, has has entered a plea of not guilty. That's Teddy DiBiase Jr. And so we'll see how that all plays out. Uh, but but the case is has been going on for a long time. He's the and son of the, uh, the the wrestler. That's correct. He's the son of Ted DiBiase, who's for for wrestling fans out there is known as the Million Dollar Man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, my big concern, Pete, at the end of a case like this is the same concern that that really Congress had when they heard about this. That yeah, this case got a lot of notice because it's it's a big dollar amount and it involves some well known people, professional wrestlers and professional athletes and the like. But the, the concerning thing here is that what happened in Mississippi could very easily happen somewhere else. All the ingredients that exist in Mississippi exist in all these other states that are handling welfare money in this way and giving out these big grants to nonprofits. And so I testified before Congress uh, a year or so ago, and they made the point in the meeting, look, we're worried this Mississippi case is emblematic of a more systemic problem. And so part of the point of the book for me was to try to inform the rest of the country about what happened here so that ideally it doesn't happen somewhere else. Yeah. Well, I hope that uh, that is absolutely the case. I didn't I didn't see your congressional testimony. I want to go back and, and watch that now. It's on C-SPAN, which is always really exciting. Stuff. But, hey, it's got to be on YouTube. That means as well. <laughs> I like C-SPAN uh, sometimes. So, I mean, to me, the most outrageous thing was simply that if money is earmarked to go to poor families and it's not used for that, or in this case, you know, Brett Favre gets it or some wealthy person or individual gets it. That to me seems to be the most egregious detail always to me. How often do you come across that? I would imagine it's often. It's one thing if money's supposed to go to uh, kids for school lunches or the programs. I mean, all these things are pretty egregious when you find out that it doesn't get there. But man, that was that was the detail to me that was the most upsetting, that hand money was going to build, as you mentioned, you know, an arena, a brick and more. How does that help uh, poor folks? Obviously, it doesn't. And so is that not the the worst part of this and often the worst part of any of these cases? Yeah, you know, we do have a lot of cases where. The, the thief, the person stealing the money, is kind of a mid-level person in an organization who just happens to have access to the procurement process or the cash of the organization. Mm-hmm. So it's not always a super rich person who's who's doing the stealing. We do have cases where, you know, we've identified somebody who is on Medicaid, lying to get on Medicaid, who's living in a 7,000-square-foot home and has an ownership stake in, in 40 different LLCs. You know, so we do have those kinds of cases in this particular case, yeah, we've got a situation where uh, the beneficiaries, especially the head of the state agency and the head of the nonprofit, were uh, were folks who, uh, you know, rolled in in high profile circles down here in Mississippi, and they were not considered, you know, uh, poor folks sitting on the street or something like that. You know, we had folks here who were well known who were at the center uh, of this entire thing. And I'll go back to a thing you alluded to really quickly, which is, is it the is the worst feature of this case that those folks end up with some of this money? Well, I will say this, you know, one thing that I think Brett Favre has misunderstood about this entire case is, you know, even if even if he had, say, performed all of the duties under that contract that we found where he went to give speeches and and he did all this stuff for the one point one million dollars. I think people would still be angry because we usually don't we don't like it for our celebrities to be paid a million dollars to give four or five speeches and for the million dollars to be coming from a fund that's supposed to go to poor people. I mean, that's part of the problem here is that we we look at this and we think, I mean, this money is supposed to go to help folks who are needy, uh, not some of the folks who ended up benefiting from some of the money. And, and in text messages, Mr. Favre acknowledges that, you know, this is government money. And also he asked whether or not, you know, this money is supposed to go to folks in shelters. That's the word that he used. He also asked whether or not anybody will ever find out about him getting this money or whether the media can find out. So these are the kinds of things that have emerged over the course of the last few years. And, and it tend to, tends to make folks mad, I think. Did he break any laws? 
he's not been charged with a crime. Uh, and, and I leave it to prosecutors to make that decision. Right. We we dig up the facts. We send it to prosecutors and they make the decision about whether to charge an individual with a crime. Um, in civil court, the state is suing a bunch of people. And Brett Favre is one of them to try to get the money back. And so that doesn't necessarily mean if you lose that case that you have violated a criminal statute, but you can lose that case and have to stroke a big check back to the state. Definitely. Uh, it's just crazy. I mean, I give speeches. I uh, make a little money giving speeches, doing stand up, obviously. And, you know, there's nothing easier than showing up and giving a speech. I mean, it's if you can do it and, and people will pay you, you should do it. <laughs> I say to to just about anybody. I don't know how good of a speaker Brett Favre is. But if you're Brett Favre, you could run a program for poor kids teaching them football. You could do so many things to, that, to help. Poor, and, and maybe he does. I, I don't know. But like the idea that you would take the money meant for uh, needy families for speeches. And it, clearly he knew it. I remember hearing about those text messages at the time. Uh, it's just reprehensible. It's gross. Um, but not that surprising because I don't know. The guy's had a history of complaints against him for different weird behaviors, I think. But nonetheless, uh, you were the one and your team to expose it. Who's gone to jail or who's been prosecuted and found guilty? Yeah, so we've got several folks now. The, the, the main person really early on was the head of the state agency handling all of this money. So that's John Davis. He was giving a lot of the money to a nonprofit run by Nancy and Zach New, and they have both pleaded guilty to, to either state or federal charges. Their accountant, Ann McGrew, has pleaded guilty. Brett DiBiase, who's the who's another son of Ted DiBiase, uh, he he pleaded guilty for his role in all this. He he claimed that he was uh, being paid TANF money to uh, to to be trained on how to teach drug rehab classes when in fact he himself was going to drug rehab on the money. Uh, so those are some of the folks that have pleaded guilty. Christy Webb was another individual who's pleaded guilty. She was running a different nonprofit. Of course, Jacob Van Landingham, who's a former business associate of Mr. Favre's, he's the one who uh, who had the company Prevacus, the experimental concussion treatment company. So those are the key players who at this point have pleaded guilty. Man, I got to say, this is one of the most interesting interviews I've done for for the reason of, well, obviously, this is a really interesting issue. But for me, researching you, I was shocked to find out your own personal political views, which you make no secret of. Uh, after having read about you in this book and what you did, I want to try to, if, if you don't mind, try to um, talk a little bit about that, because you are a Christian conservative um, and, a, and a Trump supporter, which sh- shocked me. It just shocked me. You're a Rhodes Scholar, Harvard educated guy, uh, doing, you're cracking down on, on corruption. I just couldn't, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I want to ask you some other questions, but I, I really wanted, this was my big question to you. I was like, well, I don't understand. When I found out that he was a Trump supporter, I was like, I, I don't, how can this guy who roots out corruption for a living support the most corrupt guy who's been, you know, found guilty of all types of corruption throughout his life, but more importantly, ethics violations and like 3,700 instances while he was in the White House of, of making money off of his own, his own businesses and so on. Like, I, I, I just couldn't help me understand that, given your record of rooting out corruption, how you then can support the most corrupt guy we've ever seen. You and I probably disagree over uh, most of what you just said. OK, uh, but but look, I, I grew up in southern Mississippi, conservative values. As you said, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm used to being around folks who disagree with me. I spent most of law school surrounded by people who disagree with me. And for a lot of them, you know, I was the first conservative that they'd ever met. Um, I, I have traditional values. I have traditional values rooted in the a belief in, in law and order. Uh, that we need tighter control over our border, that we need more cops on the streets. I think that government often gets in the way of human flourishing. Uh, I think that if you look at the role of government in the past few decades, I think it's tended to make the the rich richer, and I think it's tended to hurt middle class folks more frequently. Uh, so those are the kind of the things that under in my personal views and, and look, you know, if, if you want to get into the back and forth of, uh, well, that's all, no, but that's all conservative. Those are all conservative principles. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with some of that, the, the outcomes of what you're saying, but those are all, you know, traditional conservative principles. I think it's fair to say what you think, but, but, and we don't have to do a big back and forth. I just, you don't think that Donald Trump is corrupt. No, I, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the judicial activity against president Trump um, is done on the basis of politics and not on the basis of uh, a good faith understanding of the law. And I've written a little bit about that too. Uh, so I'll give you an example. 
the fraud case, the alleged fraud case involving some of his real estate dealings in New York. Uh, that case, in my mind, sh- should never have passed muster. No prosecutor should look at that case and say, oh, you know what? we got a good fraud case here. It- it's a weird interpretation of the statute that's never been done in that way before. There's no clear victim in that case. So the bank where he took out a loan got fully repaid. Even when the bank folks got on the stand and testified about it, they didn't seem to have a problem with him as a client. So those are the kinds of things that I see. And and when folks say, well, he got convicted of whatever, 37 felony counts or whatever it may be. I always think back about those cases and think if he were not a a Republican candidate for president, I just think simply think he would not have. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even I, I, I won't argue that one. I'm talking about when he was president, the Citizens for Ethics, who's a nonpartisan group, found 3,700 conflicts of interest. I mean, specifically, I just don't understand how you, the auditor, can look at a guy who, while he was president, he rooted so much money to his own properties, 547 visits to his properties. That's corrupt. Well, I I tend to doubt the bipartisan nature of some of these nonpartisan uh, no, groups. but forget about and, that. Forget about that. that. But, you know, if, Just the if point. that actually had happened, I think he'd have been prosecuted for that, too. I mean, certainly they're trying to prosecute him for every possible thing they can think of right now. Uh, and, and so the other piece of this is national politics is is particularly nasty, as yeah. you know. And, and, you know, for a long time we were comparing President Trump versus President Biden. And, and I think you could write a book and Peter Schweitzer has actually on some of the issues, the corruption issues with the Biden family. So you're never going to have a perfect person that you're going to vote for for president of the United States. But I'm a big fan of President Trump because of the policies that he had when he was in office. And I think those were better policies for America than what we got under President Biden. That's so really so moving point. past corruption, then I'll appeal to I was ap- appealing to the auditor in you on that one. I'll appeal to the Christian in you now. He's a rapist and he's assaulted dozens of women. Why does that not immediately make a guy like you go? I've seen interviews with that woman and, and the, the, the all of the women, all this. of the women shed. There's dozens and dozens of women. Plus, you saw him. You heard him say you can grab a woman by the pussy if you're famous. Like as a Christian, don't you immediately go? Don't you have daughters? Like, don't you say I could never, ever support someone who thinks or says that? And not to mention, you could dispute one case if you want, but you can't dispute I would imagine you as an auditor, if someone in your office had two complaints, you'd be concerned. Three, you'd probably be really concerned. But dozens, you would I, I think you would be less than concerned. You'd get rid of that person. You'd investigate that person. You don't believe any of the women or himself when he says I assault women. Cheated on all no. his wives, all of them. No, look, I, I, I if those if those complaints were real, then he would have been prosecuted. No, 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 no. But. But so I just I simply Christian don't believe conservative, a lot no, but of that. And then and you then believe he cheated on, on his wives. You know, you're you're going to have you're going to have, you know, rough edges around any sort of candidate. And I just I simply look at the policies at the end of the day. And that's, that's not what the I person. I think Joe Biden. You don't care about the Harris person. Complete, complete disaster for this. country. Fair enough. Many but you don't the people streaming across the border. That's got to stop. We have people dying of fentanyl overdoses because the border is open. And, and if you want to talk about something he said on an interview or with a hot mic a few years ago, we can. I just don't think that's the big you don't issue. Th- you don't have any problem that he had affairs on all of his wives, the last of which was with a porn star. No problem with that. As a Christian, uh, again, I mean, you, as a you dad, can debate those allegations, if you want, to, well, you don't believe them back on a lot of those. You don't believe I just them. I don't think that those are like the real things that normal voters. Hold on, Chad. Let me just be single day because let- they're really focused on, you know, how is their life? What was their life like under President Trump? Sure. What is their life going to be going forward? And, and I think if you've got but, millions of people streaming across the border, you've got a ton of violence in our streets. You're worried about your taxes going up when tax cuts expire. Those are the kinds of things that normally well, I know, I know but you know, you, that's you the stuff that I think about, too, when I'm making a decision about who I'm going to support as president. I, I hear you. He's an incredible president during, during his period. <laughs> uh, all like 150 historians said he was the worst president ever. They weren't all liberal. I'm, you think? Let me move on. I mean, I just I'm just shocked hey, that can you I make think, a point about that too. Well, hold, hold, was, hold on. Let me when just. When I was a law just, student at Harvard, yep. uh, I think we had over 100 tenured professors at, at that period. Do you want to guess how many had made donations to Republicans? Yeah, I can imagine why not. I can imagine <laughs> why not. Yeah, but but no. Let me, the point is the point is almost none. The point right. is almost none. The academia is heavily, heavily weighted toward Democrats. And you can tell by looking at people's donations to candidates. Those are that's public. I, I want to get into your I want to get so into when your... I hear, you know, a hundred professors say that Donald Trump is is the worst president ever. 
I don't care what they think. I would be more interested in hearing what 100 oil field pumpers think about their daily lives and whether or not they're voting for Donald Trump for president. That, those are the kinds of people that I think about every day. That's that's the kind of folks I grew up with. My dad's an oil field pumper. Those are normal, good, salt of the earth people who are American voters who want a better life for themselves. Just, that's a, the, those just two the things you said that were that they just got a, that are incorrect. But actually, border crossings are way down under Biden, and so is crime. Way down. Violent crime yeah. by almost every category is way down. But we could ping pong that. I just, I just, there, my thing not, was you don't. I, I, Go ahead. You you, you talk about. I, I never actually understand this, and I especially don't understand it from conservatives because they talk so much about virtues and, and, and religion and so on. But I would put my morals up against yours, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not religious anymore any day, and I would never compete on those morals. What I, what I don't understand is why we don't both agree that regardless of the if, – if someone supports policies we like, if that person is not a good person – we won't support them. And so that's what I'm so you you keep going into the policies, but I'm telling you, he cheated on all of his wives. And it used to be if you did that in America, certainly the right Christian conservatives would not be forgiving. A lot of people on the left wouldn't be either. But you don't I just to be clear, you don't believe that he cheated on his wives. His own kids have admitted it. No, again, I, I just think that most normal Americans think, how is my life going to be going forward? And what are the policies that each president represents? And look, I'll, I'll just throw it back at you, too. You, you may have moral qualms with some of the stuff that President Trump has said or done or whatever it may be. Have you spent as much time on the stuff that the Biden family has done? I mean, that that's that's where we get into the real. Meat I mean, the there's, matter, no right? there's, there's, there's no there's no comparison so between corruption on the other side, too. <laughs> We're better off debating about what the country is going to be like going on. All right. So let's move on. To, let's move on to that, because I really fast. I haven't talked to anybody who, who uh, has your views on uh, the anti DEI views that you have. You have been really outspoken against DEI. As a matter of fact, in, in your in your role as auditor there, apparently you found what you identify as twenty four million dollars against. I think it's eight public universities uh, that, that you that you consider is waste because it's going to. DEI funding. You put a, I think, a press release uh, about that. Do I have that right? Yep, twenty three million. Twenty three million dollars uh, that is somehow earmarked for DEI initiatives or people who work in DEI. And, and I looked it up, and you know, one public university is like eighty million dollars that they get, I think, from the state. But then you got University of Mississippi. I guess they get a lot of private money, right? But they got a half a billion dollars. Uh, so when you break it down, that's probably what is it per university that twenty four million because. It would seem not that you're going to care about this, like a drop in the bucket. But what I'm more, what I don't understand is why you find it your responsibility to. to this seems like you 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 don't like the policy, which is fine, but it's not illegal for government to spend money on DEI initiatives, and yet you're making it sound like it is. I'm I'm confused about the legality of the DEI thing. No, I've I've never said. Not once that it's illegal to spend money on DEI. Uh, going back to so the it's just political. Well, I'm an elected official, so I'm allowed to talk about the issues that I care about. And, and also, right. if you look but, closely at the statute in Mississippi, the auditor's office since the mid 90s has had broad leeway to look at how we spend money and then to talk about it, to do studies on it. So we've done what we call performance analyses, performance audits. Uh, to talk about where money is going. And then I'm an elected official. The voters elect me not only for my competence, I hope, but also because of the views that I have. And that that allows me to highlight specific expenditures that I think that most voters will not agree with. And so DEI is one of those. And I'll, I'll tell you very briefly why. Uh, if you look at these DEI programs, the words diversity equity, inclusion, those sound like nice words to a lot of people. But when you dig into what the money is going toward, it is incredibly controversial and at best wasteful at at worst, I think, plain evil. So we will have DEI, DEI programming at the University of Mississippi telling students that one of the biggest problems with America is whiteness. What is that about? Why are we using someone's skin as an adjective and then telling kids that that's a bad thing. Can you imagine if we walked into a public school classroom down here and we said, you know, one of the big problems is blackness. 
That's a horrible thing to say to somebody. Well, that wouldn't so be. We don't need to be financing that with taxpayer dollars. That's a horrible. Political so you're cherry agenda. picking one thing that you read, but like the is the money I can go on? Is that, well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can. We could go back and forth with it all day. How long is your show? <laughs> no, no, I appreciate your time. We got a few more minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about this because I, like I said, I don't talk about. It. It's obviously the a, a huge and controversial topic. Let me. Let, how about a quick lightning round, and you can take as much time as you want. I'd love short answers, um, and sure. we could drill out. So, do you? Do you disagree with Brown v. Board, which desegregated schools in Mississippi, the Supreme Court decision? No. Okay. Who disagrees with Brown v. Board? A lot of people do. Like a lot of people do. I saw it. A federal judge like would not answer that question. So I'm glad that that's you. You obviously you support integration in schools and think that I that's a public go- schools in Mississippi. Yeah. yeah. OK. I, yeah. I just wanted to be clear about that. The other one that I think is. Well, here's the other one. I, also that I th- have shoes on, by the way. I mean, that's a that's like a 1960s question right there. Come on. Listen, I. I I don't think so. I think we've gone so far, and I would have been shocked if you said yes. I would have been. I'm glad you said no and that you support it. But we've seen we've seen a lot of people make these arguments in right wing media, and even those uh, I've seen a judge testify and wouldn't answer that question, which up until last year I think everybody would have answered easily the way that you just did. So simply, so I'm happy to hear that. The other issue that I find just crazy uh, is that a vast majority of Americans, when asked, feel like they are more persecuted and discriminated against. Um, white people, vast majority of white folks think they are more discriminated against than black people. Do you think white people are more discriminated against in America in any way, systemically or in any other way than black people? I don't know about that. I mean, people can come to their own conclusions. You don't about, know about that. I, I have no idea. I, I, I haven't lived every person's experience. Don't know at all. Uh, I think that what we should be shooting for is a society that doesn't treat people any differently based on the color of their skin, a society that treats people based on the content of their character. That's a controversial statement these days, but you know who said it, right? Yeah, but guys like you always quote just that part and not all of the other you things know, that Martin Luther King said. Who said it? <laughs> Did Martin Luther King not say, say that? Bingo, 100%. Yeah, yeah but Luther why don't you quote 100%. the rest of what he said about people? People who believe what you believe now, like these things that you believe oh, now. He, on, that's unfair. No, it's that's not unfair. unfair. It's unfair for you to take one. Of course, we should do that. That's the easiest thing he said. But he was an anti-capitalist, which you which I mean, today, Americans would not support Dr. King. They would think he's a radical. And, you know, all right. So so you don't think that white people you don't you won't answer. You don't think that's an easy answer. That black people are more discriminated. I, I just, I'm not going to pretend to know everybody's personal lived experience. Well, do you think I'm just tell when you, you hear what I think the world, how we ought to approach the world? That's, sure, that's what I'm saying. Uh, then this is a this should be a layup for you. What do you think when you hear people like me and others say systemic racism? What do you think that refers to or means? Nonsense. What, what do you think it's nonsense? Racism. Like I don't understand what the mythical system is that we're talking about. If you can point to specific examples, I can tell you whether or not I've, I know enough about it. To, to well, in say, your state, well, I'll point to an example. I'll, I'll point I, to. A... I think that if we if we talk too much about this weird, vague notion of racism that sits like a cloud over. I'll give society, you two. No, but I, we're telling yeah. young people to think of themselves as victims first, and that's really, really dangerous. That is not going to lead to human flourishing either. We need to tell people that, look, you have control of your own destiny. You can achieve what you want to achieve. Those are the values that we ought to be. I fully agree with that, which is why I think it's so weird that you support Donald Trump. Uh, You support Donald Trump, who is a grievance factory. So are so many of his supporters. It's all grievance. Like I said, white people are constantly saying they are the victim. No one is more of a victim than Donald Trump. He has said probably a thousand times, no one's been treated me worse than me. And you're decrying that idea. And I agree with you. I think it's a bad idea to go through life with victimhood. I recently, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, I recently, because I had a pretty good life, Shad, uh, things came undone in my life over the past few years. And I sat a lot of self-pity. I had no idea how insidious that was. Feeling sorry for yourself, it's parallel to that kind of victimhood. So I fully agree with you. I just don't understand how you can support someone who thinks he's the worst victim ever. But I will give you examples of systemic resistance uh, that you say it's nonsense. So in your state, I'll give you two examples and you can let me know what you think. In your state, if you uh, were found to have committed a felony and went to jail, when you get out of jail, you never get your right to vote back. Hundreds of thousands of black people and white folks, too, but way more black folks don't get to vote. And the other one is that your state does not allow the Medicaid expansion, which would cover the health care of lots and lots of black folks. 
Those are two things that are systemic and that affect black folks disproportionately way more than white folks. But furthermore, I mean, that's just right now in Mississippi. Of course, your history has probably the worst history of racial terror in any state in the country. Yeah, racism only lived here. Definitely. No, no, no. I said it's the worst in, of any state. Listen, we can go through we can go through history if you want. But obviously, people know about let's talk about, let's talk about Medicaid expansion sure. for a second. I it's, mean, that, that's the most absurd claim that you made out of that okay. out of that set of claims. Uh, we haven't expanded Medicaid down here. Therefore, that's systemically racist. I mean, that's just absurd. You can have a real policy disagreement over the benefits of Medicaid versus other policies. So, for example, there was a study in Oregon that said that folks on Medicaid actually had worse health outcomes than folks who did not have health insurance. So you you can say, well, it's super racist to not expand Medicaid, but it's not even obvious that Medicaid is something that is going to lead to ideal health outcomes. Not only that, but the way Medicaid expansion was being discussed down here would have kicked tons and tons of folks off of private health insurance who got their health insurance off the federal exchange. And so doctors would be the first to tell you, no, that's not going to lead to better outcomes for those people. That's going to lead to worse outcomes because it's going to mean that the doctors are reimbursed less when they actually go to show up for the doctor's visit. So look, Medicaid expansion is a highly complex thing. And to say, oh, well, that's evidence of systemic racism. It's just absurd because you're skipping past the important policy discussion and going to a place where you're calling somebody a name for disagreeing with you. You're calling them. No, I'm talking about rating a systemically racist system. And you don't want to have the policy discussion. No, I'm having the policy. That's that's not the right way to handle these. Well, you're not talking about you're not talking about me. I'm 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 talking about policy. But but there's no you didn't know any of the stuff that I just talked. Yes, about. I did. I've, 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 yes, I did. To skip straight past. No, no. To, I knew. I knew that. I knew. The, I knew. I, not true. Stuff. Not true. I knew the talking point about the Oregon study. It's been debunked over and over. I've I've heard. No, all, I've been doing not. this. No, we can agree not. to disagree. But I've been doing this for a long time. So I'm a policy guy. I talk to policy experts for a living. That's all I've done for ten years. Doesn't make me an expert. Be clear. But I am trying to talk policy with you. I'm not calling anybody names. So I don't think I've called you or anybody names. But I mean. The effects of, of, of decades of systemic racism in your state, do you not think that that is an issue? When did Mississippi stop being racist? I think it's a silly in terms question. Of poli- in terms of policies. I, I think it's a silly question. And, you know, most people would point to the end of the Jim Crow era as being the end of the time when there was real clear laws set in place that, that disenfranchised black folks. And, and look, you know, you look at the results Today, Mississippi has more black elected officials than any other state in the entire country. Did you know that? That they has got more black people. It's a third of the state is black. That doesn't make you yeah. less racist. Yeah. That's because black yeah. people are voting despite the fact that you in the state no, no, actually no, 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 try no, no, to make no, no. it harder. Stop. You didn't you answer the felon issue. About. You don't know what you're talking about. You didn't answer Look, the felon issue. The Supreme issue. Court hearing in the Shelby County Supreme Court hearing a few years ago, Chief Justice John Roberts pointed out that black folks in Mississippi show up to vote more frequently than white folks do. So – how is that an a- a- example? How is Mississippi still an example of systemic racism if that's the well, case? Well, there's plenty of examples. You could do – I could get – we could go back and forth all day, and it's your state, and all I have to do is a little research on public health, education, any number of issues that you want to discuss, job placement. I mean, you, obviously, Mississippi doesn't no. fund the public schools. They're very segregated. I mean, Jackson doesn't even have clean drinking water, and you're acting like you guys have – I mean – Who's in charge of Jackson? Oh, black it's folks, it's their people? fault. Yeah. No, it's black people that don't get funding from the state. I mean, you can't say that it's my all the, is, it's all the black you, people's you, fault that their water is bad. Policy problems and then blaming it on racism. And there's no evidence of that. At well, all. you tell me are, what are the folks who are in charge of the city of Jackson racist? And therefore, no, the that state is the, problem? the state. No, so let's talk about it. You, you said that there's not clean drinking water in Jackson. Why is that? The reason is that Jackson has accrued north of $100 million of accounts receivable for water payments over the course of the last 20 years. Haven't collected water bills. Whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? It's the folks who have been running Jackson, each individual mayor who came along the way. And so that's that's what we've got to blame. We've got to say, all right, look, we needed better leadership along the way, and now we need better leadership going forward. That's the bottom line. It's not some cloud of racism that hangs over everything. It's individual policy choices that are being made. I mean, individual policy. 
choices that are made that make it harder, for example, for black folks to vote. You just said that Shelby County, when decided, it didn't make it harder for black people to vote. But there's tons of data that says it did. Even You can point to that statistic that more black folks are coming out. But that does not make it. The thing that I don't understand is that you don't understand that when you try to take something from someone, they get mad. So, in fact, even though you what put are, an, who's in, taking something from who? Well, for, for, well, I, felons. If you, why would you take a felon who served their time right to vote? Why would you do that? That is that is was done to black folks. They were able to eventually get around that and elect after Reconstruction. But this, that law is still in effect and right now. Two hundred and thirty thousand. You're totally off the rails. Anybody who commits one of these felonies is going to bear the same set of responsibilities. Doesn't matter if you're white, doesn't matter if you're black, doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. That's not racist. That's fair. That's <laughs> applying the law consistently across the board. And I think that if you commit a felony, there ought to be some serious consequences. And one yes, of you go to prison. You what I don't understand. Right yeah. What, OK, white or black. How, how why would someone who's a Christian, as a matter of fact, think that if you commit a felony, you go to jail, you do your time. You get out, you become a model citizen. There's two Mississippians right now, white and black, who are just that case that are suing your state for their right to vote. Why would you not let that guy who committed a crime when he was 20 and now he's a social worker, he's 50, he can't vote. Why? What else good has he done? Has he donated a million dollars to charity and saved 12 baby seals on High Street? Like, come no, no, on, no. Man. Why, 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 like if you want to paint a why can't picture, he vote? He has 15 my degrees. Point, my point. My point Why can't that, he vote? My point, my point is that you don't want to answer that. Felony, regardless of who you are, regardless of what color your skin yeah. is, you should bear serious consequences. You do. I think one of those consequences, one of those consequences, ought to be you give up the right to vote because you have committed that felony. Even, you had your rights adjudicated with full due process, and a court of your peers found that you committed a serious crime. Right. Therefore, one of those consequences ought to be taking your right to vote away. But you don't think, right, so you don't think doing your time, getting out of prison, becoming a model citizen, you should regain the right to vote. You disagree with that. I can't say it any clearer. Okay. No, okay. I can't be any clearer. Okay. I, I don't think that. Well, you made a sarcastic remark about, you know, other nice things that he's done. But obviously, I think that's ridiculous. You shouldn't have to. If you do your time and and you get out, the idea – it's very rare, by the way, obviously, in states across the country and countries across the world that your vote is taken away. It's very, very punitive, and I think it makes no care. sense. All right, last okay. one. Uh, I remember – I interviewed Christian conservatives against the death penalty. Where are you on the state putting people to death? Oh, look, I, I'm I'm in favor of the death penalty. I think that if Shocking. you have had your rights adjudicated in front of a jury of your peers, that there ought to be serious consequences, and that ought to be on the table, 100%. All right. All right. Well, I hope to do this again with you. I, this is the fun part. Uh, the hard part is preparing for this uh, book and and the case uh, and trying to understand all the legalities of it and so on. Uh, the fun part is is this latter latter half. I really appreciate you engaging. Well, look, I, I, I mean this honestly too. I have fun in these discussions. Uh, I spent most of my life in an environment where I was surrounded by people who disagreed with me, especially most of my adult and professional life before I came back to Mississippi. So uh, I have fun in these discussions too. Um, I'm animated, but at the same time, that's because I'm passionate about what I believe, as are you. And so I think that's fine. And I think these kinds of discussions are actually good for Americans to have, uh, as opposed to the more siloed discussions that we often get um, on national TV. Yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to do with it, do it with you again. I, I don't think you answered me. Are you going to run for governor? I haven't decided yet. But you're uh, thinking about it. Complete truth. Yeah, I, I'm seriously considering it right now. I haven't decided yet. I think some of it will depend on... Um, you know, our, our ability over the course of the next few years to craft a vision for the future of the state and, and to see whether or not that's compelling to people. But look, I, I think at some point in the near future, somebody has got to take all this stuff that we have found in the auditor's office, specifically all of the waste, and has to fix some of that kind of stuff. And um, and I'm hoping that those policies get done. That would, that would be 27? The next election is yeah, would be if you if you ran. All right. Well, I will do everything I can to prevent you from winning by having you on this show. Luckily, you don't vote down here and I can handle myself. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I have no doubt that you can. I really appreciate you uh, joining me and talking about it. The book is Mississippi Swindle. It's fascinating. Congratulations and good luck. 
Well, there you go. I'm very eager to hear how you thought about that, how I handled it, and what I could have done better in that conversation with Chad White. I hope that he will come back, but a lot of listeners miss me having folks on that I disagree with, and certainly we disagree with uh, on quite a bit. So hopefully that came across as well as I wanted it to. I'm not sure. Maybe I got a little bit whiny at some points. But I uh, greatly appreciate Chad White for joining me. The book again, Mississippi Swindle. And uh, you can learn more about him in the show notes as always. That's all I've got time for today. I'll be back, of course, tomorrow with another episode of Stand Up. And hopefully I'll be hosting a hangout. Look for the email from me if Kamala Harris announces her VP today, which she is scheduled to do. So that's all I've got. John Carroll, take Taking us out as he always does. Be well, my friends. I love you. Be the change you want to see in the world. Listen well and-